Welcome to PeerPoint Perspectives, the securities finance podcast delivering commentary from the best, brightest and most innovative people in the world of securities lending, repo, collateral management and related areas. PeerPoint Perspectives is brought to you by the consulting team at PeerPoint Financial. So now over to your hosts. Hi, before we get to today's episode, I want to make it clear that this podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Nothing you hear should be taken as investment advice, as I have no qualifications to provide investment advice, and my guest views are their own personal opinions, and also are not investment advice or recommendations. Do your homework elsewhere, and make your decisions only after speaking with a qualified advisor. Today's episode also has some instances of what I consider to be mild profanity, so if you are easily offended, I suggest you skip today's podcast. Thanks, and now let's get to the show. Hello, and welcome to episode 15 of PeerPoint Perspectives, The Art of Securities Finance. I'm your host, Roy Zimmerhansel, and practice lead at PeerPoint. Now, regular listeners will recall my interview with James Clooney of Jupiter, where we explored the challenges of short-selling overvalued companies when looking at the fundamentals. So this is where you see the ongoing debates over high-profile names like Tesla and Netflix. And these long-short portfolios are a big proportion of the community that borrows securities with various new reversion strategies making up the bulk of the demand for borrowing. Then there's this group of short sellers who look into and beyond the public filings, trying to spot gaps and holes and things that just don't make sense. So these aren't people that are looking for stocks that are overvalued in the traditional sense. They're looking for stocks that are overvalued because of misleading, deceitful, or in fact, outright fraudulent activity. So here I'm thinking of Enron or Tyco, Theranos, uh, and Sino Forest. And this year we've seen claims of fraud at NMC Health and its sister company, Finabler, for example. But the big one, of course, this year is Wirecard. And I'm really excited to have today's guest joining us. He was one of the founders of Zatara Research. And when their report on Wirecard first <laughs> hit the wires, uh, so to speak, in February 2016, Wirecard shares dropped by 20%. Subsequently, his new vehicle, Viceroy Research, has produced various uh, damning reports on other companies. Um, after Wirecard, I, I guess uh, Viceroy's biggest success came with Steinhoff, a South African company, which ultimately led to the discovery of a $7.4 billion accounting fraud. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guest, Fraser Pering of Research, uh, of Viceroy Research. Good morning, Fraser, and thanks for joining me today. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So, Fraser, look, uh, I want to, to me, short selling is uh, a lot about psychology. So I guess if we look at your own personal background in social care and, and now as a short seller, you certainly don't want to take the easy path in life, do you? <laughs> well, no. Um, my background's um, social care, law and psychology. So it's, I mean, I, it's quite perverse that... As, as a short seller, I, I think I'm perhaps more qualified than if I had a financing degree. <laughs> so. yeah, that's actually quite an interesting observation. So I quite like doing a training in securities and lending, my, my sort of own area of, back, uh, of expertise. The reason I like doing introductory courses is because I have people that don't think like I do asking me all kinds of questions. So I guess it's it's kind of the same thing. You've been doing this for a little bit less than 10 years now. So do you think you kind of approach it differently to people with, I guess, finance backgrounds? Well, yeah, but finance background is, it, 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 I've learned a lot as I've come along. But essentially speaking, there, there needs an element, particularly with short selling, of life skills because it's not just about the granular model of um, how the accounts work or what the forecasts are. It's actually delving into the realities. And that's where I, I, I think particularly at Viceroy with Gabe, Ide and myself, we've, we've got life experience, which pays more dividends on the whole 
than just going to university, going and working at Goldman Sachs. And I say that very lamely because I don't feel that they get out into the real world to ascertain, well, that doesn't seem right at all. And I think that's where short selling exceeds itself is when they actually go along and they test the mechanics or something. So you're saying there's there's an element of, of knowledge, experience, but also sort of gut feeling, which I guess the wider your experience, the, the more useful that is? Uh, pretty much. You, you, you um, Particularly with um, certain companies, our, our latest project that we're working on, a, a German company, we've been focused on it for seven months. We've interviewed victims of fraud all over the world. We've just um, won some victories in Australia that you'll see within the report where fraud victims haven't been held accountable for the debt. And so in financing, one of the arguments that Wirecard put through was that people didn't understand the accounts. And they said it about many people who were better qualified in the accounts than me. But they didn't actually dispute the very relevant facts, like their compliance officer having an IT qualification and no compliance qualifications. So they started lying. And when a company starts lying in the accounts, they have to verbalize it as well. And if they can't, they either have to attack, as Wirecard did very successfully, or they have to lament and admit wrongdoing. Most of the people that I talk to and most of the trades that we see are these kind of short-term trades. And that even uh, is the case where there are other research reports saying this stock is, is overvalued. You can often see people you know, have a position, do a report, and then uh, miraculously, they never go over another reporting threshold. So Fraser, I mean, I think the, the key thing that you've talked about there is uh, the timing of this. So how do you deal with trades uh, rather than most short sellers who have relatively short-term time horizons? Yours last, you know, months and years, and much of the time that can actually be in a in a negative uh, P and L position. So, how do you deal with that, both from a, an investor point of view and, and deal with the concerns of investors, as well as just the psychological wear and tear of, of carrying that kind of a position over time? Well, the, 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 firstly, it's it's complete insanity in terms of. Um, being a short seller, you can't be sane. You can lose more than the value that you put in. So for most, the ideology of shorts is illogical. But on this, uh, the same section, you, you have to have a good investor at the back of you who understands the principles that the rewards are large if you're prepared to go the term. So normally they have a level of insanity as well, and hopefully some risk risk management as well. We don't deal at all. I avoid the trading element. I'm notoriously bad at trading. I don't want to be saying something to you while I'm trading around the edges or something. We leave that to a trade desk. And it's a lot easier because we, we take the trade or the profit and loss out of the picture and just look at the research. And then we try and risk assess it. And one of our biggest trades that, the, that we've had over the past, I think, three years was our worst. And we admitted we were wrong fairly early on. We took our losses, licked our wounds and thought, how, wait there, how did we get it so wrong? So we sort of assess each win and loss. We've only had one major loser since I've been short selling, and that was AMD. And... But we, we got our facts right, but we were completely wrong on what the market would believe us. And they, they basically ignored us and the stock took off and it cost us a fortune. But the, the, on, the, on the, the short side where we're right, generally we add. So we add post-publication and if it's going against us, we review it. You obviously have to have a risk strategy so that you aren't just blowing up the house. But you, we can add on Wirecard, I think I was adding for three years, not, not massively, not aggressively, but at each point where they're offered opportunity at 160, 170, 
where people thought there was upside on my card, I couldn't see any. So we were taking very cheap, long-dated books, and they pay immensely well. Yeah, so look, I was listening to uh, uh, the Grant Williams podcast recently with your friend Mark Cahotas and, and Bill Fleckenstein, uh, who are both pretty renowned short sellers, and they were discussing how difficult it is being a short seller in today's market. So I think... Bill was talking about it from the perspective of central bank intervention and saying, you know, that kind of distorts the market where, whereas I think Mark is, is more sort of targeting the same kind of companies that, that you do um, really looking to uncover fraud and, and sort of being in it for these sort of long haul positions. How do you find these potential candidates? Um, generally just trawling public sites. So Cafe Pharma is a, absolute money pit for short sellers because they highlight a regular practice and generally it's say a competitor having a whinge about another salesperson and the, the, how we came across my medex it was it was shocking everywhere we turned publicly so pacer and that's one of the best subscriptions i've got in life i spend about 100 bucks a month. That's a real bad payment in terms of, it just means that I'm searching, I'm curious, I'm hunting down cases between employees. And we found a lot of cases there with my medics where they were alleging wrongful sales practice, channel stuffing, um, kickbacks and illegal bribes or uh, any other type of bringing forward the revenue and the, uh, essentially speaking, they, it got to a point now you don't really need too many subscriptions to databases to expose fraud. The latest fraud we exposed is because a friend of mine, he got stuffed over by the company. And he says, I think I've been done over. And we started laughing about it. And he's been screwed by about 100 grand. And I started looking at the sales practices that this company was doing. And all of a sudden, there is no way that this can be entirely legal. You start looking further. They're involved in criminal activity, binary options. They're promising resellers payments within 20 minutes, 30 minutes, if they can get contracts over a certain value. So they're encouraging a greed or fraudulent environment. Yeah, I find it uh, one of the most amazing parts of uh, the Wirecard story and the same with Steinhoff is that regulators seem to be aware of these things or certainly you know, people try to make them aware and we don't see any kind of real action. And in fact, in the case of, uh, in the case of Wirecard, of course, rather than reacting to, to your comments or the FT investigations, in fact, the people trying to blow the whistle were being investigated themselves by the regulators rather than the companies. I find that really bizarre. The um, Steinhoff, they were, the because of the reaction from the management, they were more inclined to investigate. So we exposed more accounting fraud in Steinhoff and were attacked less by the regulator than we were in Wirecard. The regulator, and I, I was saying this only the other day, the regulator in Wirecard, it, there should be prosecutions there because they persecuted people. Right? So I, I can remember phoning up Barfin and saying, hi, blah, 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 behind the report. I even have my lawyers write to them. Yeah, um, They threatened me with a gun. They've done this. They've done that. And they, 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 didn't, they weren't interested in it at all. But they managed to leak to the press. They were going to prosecute me for market manipulation, even though all the facts were right. So, honestly, you, how a regulator, and they sit there and they say, we're only going to resign if the people want us to. So this is um, Felix Huffeld, I believe. And he's saying, I'll resign if the people want me to. So let's just do a recap. We expose widespread criminality and corporate fraud. We're attacked by the regulator. Further exposure is done, we're attacked by the regulator. Further and yet further and on and on over the years. And then we're prosecuted 
because our information is accurate, but the regulator is so incompetent. But then they finally admit that they were trading Wirecard shares. That must be a first. So the regulator, Barfin, who's prosecuting or was prosecuting me for market manipulation, is trading Wirecard shares. You can't make this stuff up. And the, the only thing, if you're an up and coming or you want to be a short seller, the only thing is do not give in. We had to accommodate certain prosecutor wishes because of the incompetence of someone else that wasn't prepared to stand their ground. And I, I see it many times where the reality is the, the, the short sellers don't just come at this after a week. I haven't just researched on the back of some crappy site that someone said something. I've actually followed it up with in-depth interviews all over the place. We've interviewed nearly 200 people on our next report. What? And it's going to be all lies. They're, even lawyers admitting that the scam is widespread. We've interviewed them. And we don't just, we do not just accept that people are doing certain things. We, we go and test it. So if you tell us, Fraser, I've been scammed by this company, prove it. Because we're going to have to prove it. And people do not realize the lengths that the regulator, particularly with Wirecard, it, it, if they are not held to account by the end of the year, people are going to have to take legal action against them. I will, because how you can persecute. And they, they deliberately put out misleading statements, the, the Zatara report, that my statements on Wirecard were wrong. People should treat them with caution and then persecuted me. So if they treat them with caution, why didn't they investigate them? How can the second person in command at Barfin, Elizabeth Rosler, how can she be implicated in the Comex scandal, which is a German dividend tax fraud, and yet still have a position? The, the, Germany has turned into the new China. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a little bit interesting. We we've done um, blog posts on both Wirecard uh, and after the uh, European Banking Authority report on dividend arbitrage, which followed on from the Comex trials, so people can see stuff on our site about that. But but it is it is really fascinating that these sorts of practices can can come to light in in large corporations like i'm stunned in the face of regulators you know I've, i come from a background working in investment banks where where literally your personal trading was under so much scrutiny that uh, most people didn't bother going through the paperwork and to hear that regulators even though i guess the argument was baffin wasn't regulating wirecard at that time so so why should they be constrained i'm surprised they are allowed to trade anything at all well you've got you a, it shouldn't be permitted, but more interestingly, Barfin were made aware of things that were improper at the bank. So they've said they couldn't regulate because it was a fintech organisation. Firstly, they said it was because as ESMA, the European Stock Market Authority, said they couldn't. It wasn't a bank, it was fintech. And then ESMA came out and said, no, we didn't say that. So Barfin changed their story and said, oh, we were only permitted to investigate the bank. It was a whole bucket load of fraud at the bank that they weren't even investigating. So which story or pack of lies do they want to go with? So we know that binary options was highly prevalent in the bank. We know that they were using it, quote, unquote, there were associations with terror financing. Wouldn't you investigate? So the FIU didn't investigate. The Financial Intelligence Unit. Barfin didn't investigate. Who did? There were only a couple of politicians that were being attacked by Wirecard supporters. And then it turns out one of those people is paid for by Wirecard to lobby the German government. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, sort of the financial terrorism angle to that, because I think one of the angles that's coming out of the Comex uh, dividend issue is that uh, ESMA and so the European uh, Commission actually wants to start classifying these 
you know, these sorts of abuses as financial terrorism. And so it's possible, and we've seen ESMA kind of overrule sort of local competent authorities, I think, in the past, uh, very infrequently, but it has happened. And and I think there's going to be a higher standard, and it sounds to me like the one is definitely required. And there should be. The, 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 the level or standard that people should be held to should be the same as the short reports. You know, the, Germany calls um, a short report a short attack, which implies there's a victim. And they, it, by the very phrase short attack, um, it implies the company's a victim. But in reality, it's the victim. The, the victims are created by the company. With Wirecard, it was the investors who invested post Barfin's involvement and ESMA, the short selling ban. A first in German history that one company got a short selling ban, and it was based on complete lies, the application. They know that now, but where's the apologies? So we're expected to be investigated and we have to present with lawyers and things like that. And that's one thing I would encourage. People say anonymous short sellers are there because they want to hide. It's quite ironic that the regulators knew who I was in terms of the publication. I didn't hide from a regulator. I hate because I didn't want to be held against my will. I didn't want my house broken into. All of that happened. Yeah, I'll come back to the personal side of things in a moment because I think that's really important part of part of the saga of a lot of these uh, fraudulent shorts. But but look, I th- my own opinion on regulators is that they're there to look for manipulative trading practices on the long side or the short side. <clears throat> so I don't personally have an issue with them uh, looking at the trading uh, activity of uh, traders, be they long or short. You don't want people pumping up markets irrationally. You don't want them driving down uh, markets on on rumor and innuendo as opposed to, to facts. So, so I think part of a process does involve looking at sort of trading patterns of, of those involved in the market. But equally, I think the thing that's missing here is uh, the investigation into the allegations themselves, which seems to be almost entirely absent. You know, we had uh, uh, ESG is, is such an important uh, principle now that's really gathering momentum, particularly in Europe for investors. And it seems to me that short sellers provide a really valuable function in, in identifying companies that mislead the public and, and that poor governance. You know, we had a guest blog last week from a portfolio manager who said that actually short selling is a positive contributor to ESG goals. So, so do you, in, in your work, do you actually see that your efforts as being a benefit to the market or just a way for you to make money for yourselves and your investors? It's price discovery more than anything. So um, companies are all too good at promoting everything that's good about them. We're, we're expanding our bottom line by this. Our revenues are growing by this. I'm sure everyone's heard some of the drivel that these fraudulent companies have blurted out um, time and time again. But no one actually digs into the finesse. And one of the things that's standing out at the moment is the um, the Rio Tinto issue to do with the caves for the indigenous people in Australia, where it was highlighted that they were culturally important. They were 46,000 years old. And they, they were, shall we say, a mecca for the indigenous people it wasn't respected. In essence, it was blown up for the sake of iron ore. I don't know the full facts behind it, but that's how I perceived it when I read it. And yet people haven't actually called out and gone, hang on, wait there, we have to sign up to this socially responsible governance, yeah, environmentally and socially. How does Rio Tinto get around that? I'm not short the stock. I've been long it for a long time. The dividends are good. It's not difficult to be a cash cow in an environment with $120 a tonne iron ore. But importantly, where do they stand? So for me, do I ethically go, hang on a minute, they, they really damaged someone's culture there. Okay, I'll sell the stock. But where'd you go? So is ESG a fad? Um, 
from a fraud perspective, no. The, yeah, with Boohoo, there's, there's a number of people believing that the companies are short because of the mechanics of the related parties. I believe it's a short because eventually people will wake up and think, hang on, they're using slave labor or cheap labor to make the, or to design the fabrics and cut it and produce them. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's interesting. You know, Buffett. Uh, I think I've heard him say that uh, you know he's not he's less concerned with ESG. So you know, make money from your portfolio, and then you can uh, you can give away to charity things that'll be good for the environment. So so he's kind of got his got his own angle on that. But but you know, I think your point on on saying let's disclose where we have issues and get over it, right? You know, I, I think companies can survive all of this, and I'm surprised that. Uh, investors aren't really, you know, big shareholders aren't really digging into these issues and saying, you know, clean up your act and we'll we'll be here along for the ride because we're in this for a long term. You know, we can we can withstand sort of short term uh, uh, hits to the uh, to the business if if it ends up creating a better company. And, I, and I'm surprised that people are reliant on short sellers to dig these out. Well, they also want to they want to ignore them as well. It's almost an excuse to double down, which is absurd. There's some short sellers in the US, and they're really good at what they do, but they they're ignored by the general market. We published alongside, not together. We weren't in concert. We we worked on the same project, same name, without knowing. Um, so we published on Sorrento. And we were shorted from 10 bucks. And it went to 20. And that, is, that isn't a good day by anyone's standards. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of those days where you, ah, you know what, it's not a good day. And so what do you do? The company jumps on every single fact. Read the report, make your own mind up. But in my opinion, they jump on every fad. If it's not COVID, if they were doing antibodies in Mars, Sorrento would be on. And the, every you can look back through history, and then you've got Athenex, where the company hadn't even opened the Chinese lab that it was t- touting around as outperforming everything. How the bloody hell can be? But did they believe it initially? No. They're starting to now because they're going, hang on a minute, it doesn't quite add up. And the problem is that people aren't prepared. If I see a short report, a a friend of mine, he did a short report, UK-based, and he did this report where it was so long and in-depth, I think it took me six hours to understand it, and I had to revisit it. I'm sure the company, I've made 10%, if that... His work is absolutely sound, but people aren't prepared to go through the report and just do a simple honesty test. Okay, let's check the facts. But you see a long report, I call them long report, a research report by JPM Goldman Sachs that says we've assessed all the parts of this business and we believe it's worth triple. And they buy it. They don't, they don't even test it but they don't even give the same veracity to any part of a a short report. And they should. Go away, test it, prove us wrong, yeah, and make sure that all our facts are correct. People went over, there were first-year law grad students that went over the Zatara report, the Steinhoff report, the Quintus report, the Caesar Stone report, and they couldn't find errors. And they were shocked that it took so long for the market to realize. Because I think the, the era where people go, ah, it's fake news, ignore it. Until it hits them in the face, they don't care now. And maybe they should, because it, there will come a dawn, particularly as capital becomes more precious, where people have to go, ooh, I don't quite believe their entire thesis, but I'd rather not invest. And surely, going, wow, there's a lot of smoke there. Hang on a minute. I'm going to de-risk. By de-risking, surely you're paying attention to common sense. And the rules are being broken at the moment. Like with Tesla, when it hit 2,400 or something like that. If I'd have shorted Tesla 
every time I thought it was overvalued, I think I'd be bankrupt now just because I'd be 20x my position or something. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that that's the issue, right? The, as the old phrase goes, you know, the market can stay irrational longer than I can stay solvent. So, but the interesting thing for me, when, when I see one of these um, short reports going on, I always think that if a company uh, believes that their story is sound and that the short report is incorrect, it seems to me that it would be a really powerful approach to just go back and refudiate all of the claims that are made with facts and uh, and evidence and say, this is why the short report is wrong. And and to me, that's that's how you deal with a short. You don't say that, you know, uh, you know, that they're mysterious or shadowy or manipulative or, or whatever it is and, and sort of have sort of emotion-based responses rather than factual responses. Well, well that's why I, I took after the wire card attacks on me, and I call them attacks because they were personal on a personal level. I took the view that anyone that attacks me now from a professional standpoint in the in commerce. So if I publish a report like my medics put up the short selling commentary web page that they've taken down now because they know it was entirely misleading and wrong. I've taken the view that if they want to attack, I now sue them. And all of a sudden you should see how defensive they are. We're in litigation. Oh, no, we don't want to give you this evidence or information because you're going to misuse it. No, I know I'm right. I'm not going to misuse it. And you're going to pay me. So it's another income line for me. Yeah, well, it's interesting. It could almost be an indicator where if they aren't refuting the facts and they're attacking you personally, it's like, well, don't you have more something more substantive to argue against? I want to actually get to um, to so your your personal experience. But first, uh, again, part of the audience here will be securities lenders. And one of the things that uh, when I talk to institutions about lending their securities, uh, they always say, well, why would I lend my securities to a short seller? Because they have a different view on the stocks than we do. We think it's going to go up. They think it's going to go down. And I went, well, yeah, but you have to understand that when you bought that stock, you were already expressing a different view from the seller. So, you know, having different opinions and points of view is what the market is. Otherwise, you wouldn't be holding anything. Um, have you ever come into problems with having a shortage of availability stock uh, of stock that you want to short or are the names you've been in, you know, been, it's been easy to, uh, to get that short exposure. Um, I think that's what screwed us on Athenex in the short term. I didn't actually appreciate how few lots of, uh, of equity were, were available on the borrow side so that we could sell them and be short. Um, yeah, I, I considered it fairly liquid and I was clearly proven wrong, particularly for about four or five months where it, it took off. It nearly doubled on us. And I think that was due slightly to us publishing on a day where there was a, a buyer. Also, a large short was covering on the day, from what I understand, after discussions with them. And, you know, the hindsight's a wonderful thing. We try and always make sure that we publish on liquid names because they can kill you in the short term. Being a liquid in a stock isn't a good idea. The company that we're currently short at the moment is, is fairly liquid, but with recalls and the strategy used by a lot of companies now, where they get some of their investors to recall the stock. In South Africa, it's a very well-known game. But if you understand it, you can protect yourself against it. For me, um, illiquid stocks, I avoid both on the long and the short because they can kill you whether you're right or wrong. Okay, thanks. So look, uh, we touched on it a couple of times, but um, I think maybe it's sort of the last last few minutes. Talk to me about sort of the personal impact that this has had on on you and your life and your family and and and, and that. Because because the interesting thing to me that I hadn't really realized is that what you have is these companies doing fraudulent activity. They're I mean they're criminals, 
So am I really surprised that they would really follow criminals, criminal kind of behavior in persecuting the people that they think have, have revealed it? So, so talk to us a little bit about that. Um, it's really absurd because some companies aren't actually that they're, they're, they're fraudulent, but they aren't outright physically criminal, financial criminals, shall we call them. But um, in, in terms of the, just some of what we've suffered, my medics sent a private investigator that was filmed trying to bait at the time my six-year-old daughter to open the door. Filmed. We have the film of it. So what levels will they go to? That's that's minor in comparison. Amelia knows that you know you don't open the door to any stranger. Luckily, she's got common sense. But on the whole, you you know I've had my cars tracked. I I, I think it's absurd that um, half the information I'll tell you, and you've got reason to go. Nah, surely not. Right. So on the fifth of June, two thousand and twenty. At 9.35 in the morning, I had my medical records released on Twitter. Put that one out. Because I'm short a company called Biocomp. What, you think I want that had had a TIA and stroke and someone had put a metal bar through my foot and things like this? Do you think I wanted that out on um, Twitter? But amazingly, they didn't blame it on that. They, They tried to smear it with because of heroin use. I'm a short seller, I don't need heroin. Yeah, I get my buzz out of being right. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm borderline insane because you have to be for short selling. Yeah, you have your house broken into. Yeah, of course you did. Of course you did, Fraser. Okay, here's a video of it. Oh shit, um, finding, um, what's it, cameras in your head. Of course you did. Well, here's a video of that as well when we un- uncovered it. And that's why now, as soon as someone attack, I do not stop. I will bury you if you attack myself or my family. I will literally financially bury you because I've had enough of it. Because mentally, it nearly killed me. I suffered all sorts of mental impact where you're being accused of being a liar and this, that, and the other. I've had enough. So now it's game on. You want to play those? You know, if you're a company and you want to play them, I would make sure you're playing them right because otherwise you will be destroyed. Yeah, I guess the, uh, the, the way companies should be dealing with it, as I said before, is if you put something out, uh, you know, you've got a short position in it and the best way they can beat you is to prove you're wrong and uh, hit you in the pocketbook. And that's supposed to be what investing is about, you know, be decisions, opinions and profits and losses that way rather than an attack on, on the individual. So. Yeah. So listen. So thanks. Thanks for sharing those sort of personal uh, thoughts. Uh, so where next for Viceroy? Um, next week is going to be an exciting time. <laughs> you know, we're, we're we're just getting our data rooms ready so that um, we we've decided to take the view that we should publish all our facts, not just our opinion. So we we now publish a data room with it. We're looking forward to that. And then hopefully having a, a little time off after that. But we'll wait and see it. <laughs> I've never been very accurate in the short term. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's unlikely you'll be producing something next week and then taking the following week off. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, I guess people can find you on Twitter at Aim Honesty, which is A I M H O N E S T Y. And of course, yep. the Viceroy website. Where else, where else can they see your work? Um, well, hopefully we should have a new design website. We're also going into filming the victims of these fraud schemes as well. So there might be a, the, the, one of the websites to do with the personal attacks on me is criminal espionage, where we've actually been doing counter surveillance on some of the people involved. And we'll be publishing that soon, including a chap that may have a surprise, I suspect, this morning when he gets a knock at the door at midday being served for planting cameras in the hedge. You know, so the criminalespionage.com, but check Viceroy. Well, there you go. There's a scoop. Thanks. Thanks so much for your time today and your insights and uh, uh, keep uncovering those frauds. So thanks, yeah. Fraser. Thank you very much.